class there. Uh, welcome everyone uh, for today's panel on digital economy and uh, impact of big data and AI on uh, privacy and justice. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome everyone for the panel on big data and, and, and on privacy and justice. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to first thank uh, uh, University of Toronto Student Initi Initiative Fund for uh, sponsoring and supporting this event. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go on a few housekeeping things to begin with. Uh, we have enabled live transcription uh, for the panel. And uh, if you would like, you, can, uh, you could start you could enable transcription and like by clicking on live transcript on your screen. Uh, uh, so yeah, and uh, we we are like to we would like to wish uh, the history of the lands on which we are all uh, uh, and, and we are all uh, like, uh, after joining this from Canada is home to many indi different indigenous people. We ask each and every one of you take a moment to learn about and reflect upon the indigenous people on whose lands you are currently working or living on. Uh, we dedicate uh, we are dedicated to provide harassment free event experience for everyone. We do not tolerate any harassment in any form. Uh, uh, event participants violating these rules may be sanctioned and asked to leave the event. Uh, uh, to get on to in start introduce a little bit about TSPN, uh, TSPN provides a, a, a Toronto Science Policy Network, uh, provides a platform for students, graduate and undergraduate, as well as postdoctoral researchers to learn and engage in science policy. TSPN works with community to advocate for evidence-based policy and promote various discussions on science behind key policies. We do this through workshops, talks, panels, uh, and campaigns. Uh, uh, if you would like to get involved with, there are various opportunities to get involved with TSPN. And uh, for more details, you can find uh, on our website and everything uh, on that, uh, this one on our social media as well. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I would like to welcome our panelists today. Uh, we have Mr. Philip Dawson, who is a AI policy lead at Schwartz Reisman Institute of Technology and Society. He uh, uh, and uh, uh, Miss Allison Cohen uh, from Applied in AI Projects Leads at Mila Quebec AI Institute, Artificial Intelligence Institute. Dr. Brenda McPhail, uh, Director of Privacy, Technology and Surveillance uh, at Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Uh, and Dr. Christopher Parsons, uh, Senior Research Associate at Citizen Lab, Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy Toronto. I, uh, now I would like to pass, the, pass it on to Philip uh, to carry on. Uh, on to you, Philip. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks for having me here this evening. I am I'm, I'm very pleased to, to be moderating this, uh, this panel for the next uh, almost two hours, and even more so to be uh, here alongside three experts uh, who pooled together expertise in, you know, AI as a technology, in uh, law and policy and human rights, and also with uh, field experience uh, in actually in applied AI projects for 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 some very important um, purposes. The topic this evening is digital economy, the impact of big data and AI on privacy and justice. Uh, this is a topic that uh, is 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 frequently in the news. Um, and we have become more and more aware over the last few years, really the extent to which we are unaware of, of, of some of the uses of data and some of the uses of AI, and in particular, their impacts on our privacy, um, as well as on uh, as a matter of justice and democracy or human rights more generally. So uh, these are really important topics. I hope tonight that we begin to uh, unpack them a little bit and provide each of you attending with uh, just a little bit more knowledge about what exactly big data is, what exactly AI is, and some of the ways that it's, uh, it's uh, impacting 
uh, our lives uh, in terms of our, our privacy, but also some of the, the ways that it's uh, that the, the, these technologies uh, are, are a force for good in our society, uh, even can advance justice and, and humanitarian purposes. So very broadly, these are these are the issues we're going to be discussing for the next two hours. Um, and I'm sure that uh, all of you attending, and I see we have quite a few attending on the line, uh, you're all uh, here to, to, to learn from our panelists, not from me. Um, and so with that, I think we'll, we'll turn immediately to get to know them a little bit better first, and then dive into the first few questions for this evening. So uh, you've already been introduced, but might I just ask uh, Allison, uh, to to kick to kick off this evening with just by just telling us a little bit more about about yourself, your research at Mila, uh, the Montreal uh, Institute for Learning Algorithms, which is in my hometown, Montreal, and some of the work that you're involved in there. And, and then I'll have another question for you, which is, you know, could you explain for us how AI and alg and AI or algorithms are typically designed, or how they work, or a little bit of an intro to artificial intelligence. So uh, thanks very much, Allison. Thank you so much, Phil, and thank you, Bipin and TSPN for, for hosting this event and for having me. Um, so yes, my name is Allison Cohen. It's nice to meet you all. I work with Mila, which is an AI research institute based out of Montreal. Um, it's a research institute that brings together bachelors, masters, PhD, and postdoctoral students uh, from around Montreal together. And it's, uh, it's really this sort of cross-pollination of academia, public sector, and private sector, where we have a number of in-house teams who are actually developing AI technology to be used in production. Um, and that really is a big aspect of Mila's mandate to bolster the environment for AI's deployment within Quebec as well as Canada more broadly. Um, and what I do at Mila is I work with our AI for Humanity department. That department is tasked specifically with developing some best practices uh, around artificial intelligence development and deployment. Um, quite often a criticism that we get around AI um, policy and ethics is that often it's it's not really grounded in uh, more applied practices and what we're trying to do is be an incubator for some of those applied practices. Um, right now I'm working on a number of applied AI for social good projects and that means two things. One is that all of the projects in my portfolio are designed to achieve something that is meaningful from a social perspective. And the other thing that that means is, you know, in the process of that work, we can't also be uh, leveraging unethical approaches to the way that we develop this technology. So on the one hand, it's important that the tech itself is designed to do social good, but also that the underlying design uh, in the way that we collect data, in the way that we deploy algorithms, um, that that's done in an ethical way as well. Uh, so that's really the work that I'm doing, and I'm excited to talk more about that over the course of the panel. And sorry, the second question, which is <laughs> around ar what is artificial intelligence and how do you build it and what does that pipeline look like? Um, so the simplest way I can think to describe the process is you are, as we all know, training a prediction machine. You're training an algorithm to be able to predict what a future outcome will be. And you know, this doesn't happen, it's not magic. <laughs> you train it using a whole bunch of data, um, data that combines input and output variables that are connected to one another. Um, and what you're trying to do is teach the algorithm what the connection between those input and output variables are so that when the algorithm sees a future input variable, it can guess what that output variable, the corresponding output variable that that's going to be. Um, so a really classic example of this is teaching an AI algorithm uh, to recognize images of cats and know that that is an image of a cat. And the way that you do that is by presenting the algorithm with 
lots and lots and lots and lots of training data because it's very hard for these mathematical models to generalize based on very few data points. Um, so the input variable is the picture of the cat, the output variable is the label of this is a cat. So if the algorithm sees enough images of cats corresponding to the label of this is a cat, in the future it'll be able to take that input of an image of a cat and be able to tell you this is an image of a cat. Um, and the process is a little bit more complicated than just input and output variables, of course. Um, when you're building an AI algorithm, there are lots of considerations that need to be made and that go into the design of your team. Um, lots of questions around what expertise is needed and how do you make sure people are working well together because you not only need computer scientists, but a lot of the time you need social science experts as well. Um, but then from a technical standpoint, it involves collecting as much data as you'll need in order for the model to be able to make those predictions accurately in the future. Um, a lot of the time we're talking about supervised machine learning, which means providing um, algorithms with a corresponding label and uh, making sure that they know exactly what you want the model to um, be spitting out in terms of the label, in terms of its prediction. Um, so we call this annotation. And ultimately, you have to think through a lot of decisions around, you know, what are we annotating for? And who should be doing the annotation? It's very simple to give the label that a picture of a cat is in fact a cat, but it's a lot harder to do things like take a sentence that's misogynistic and say, oh, this is definitely a misogynistic sentence, for example. Um, then you develop the model. The model depends on the nature of the ML problem you're solving and the size and the scope um, of the data that you're collecting. Then you go through a process of model training. Uh, you optimize the model based on its parameters, making sure that it is treating making sure that ultimately it's well suited to that particular context. A lot of models are sort of taken off the shelf and then you need to apply them to a particular context. Um, so that's the process of optimization. And then you go through an evaluation and monitoring, which is ongoing as long as the model is in operation. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, and yeah, back to you, Phil, thank you. Great answer. I have to say that was uh, in, in, in very uh, clear and simple terms, um, a great introduction for, for everybody listening. Um, thanks again. Next, I'll turn to Dr. Brendan McPhail, Director of Privacy Technology and Surveillance at the Canadian Civil, Civil Liberties Association. Brenda, uh, I told you I would not call you Dr. McPhail all evening, so uh, we can, we can, we can be a little less, little less formal. Uh, Brenda, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your role at CCLA um, and uh, some of the projects that you're involved in and, and some of the, the areas that, uh, that you're covering. Thanks. Cleverly unmuting before she begins to talk. I'm off to a great start this evening. <laughs> Thank you so much to Bipin and the TSPN um, for having me here. This is going to be a fun conversation. Um, so as Phil told you, I direct the Privacy Technology and Surveillance Program at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. And it's a very descriptive title. My portfolio is all about what happens to privacy um, as technologies um, are created and evolve and increasingly enable different kinds of surveillance in different aspects of society. And then how does that, how do those things impact rights and freedoms for people across Canada? The CCLA, which is our abbreviation for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, I'll say CCLA a lot, so I'll tag that um, abbreviation for you for the first time. Um, the CCLA is a legal advocacy organization that's been standing up for liberties and freedoms of people across Canada uh, since 1964. And we do that by, uh, in a few different ways. We do that by bringing forward legal cases or intervening in cases in courts of all levels in all of the provinces up, up to the Supreme Court of Canada. 
we do that by engaging in advocacy uh, through activities such as making oral or written submissions on bills before federal or provincial committees who are looking at turning those bills into new laws. Um, and we do it through a really extensive public education program where our education team and all of the advocacy directors like me um, have a chance cumulatively to come face to face uh, with uh, more than 10,000 students a year at levels all the way between kindergarten to post-secondary students. Um, most of CCLA's directors, program directors, as you can imagine, a legal advocacy organization are lawyers. Um, and I'm not, I'm a researcher. And that's helpful in the privacy portfolio because privacy is a place where technological development moves far faster than the law. So doing research and connecting with people who are doing research is fundamentally necessary to develop understanding of the way technologies work and the potential of those technologies or categories of technologies like AI to impact rights, whether it's for good, because AI can have positive benefits potentially, or for ill. So current areas where I'm most active at the moment includes projects on health information privacy, especially in the context of commercial virtual care platforms, where initiatives to collect information about individuals in part to help train new AI tools to do things ranging from diagnosis assistance all the way to better targeting for pharmaceutical sales or potentially behavioral manipulation of um, patients in part um, with the aim of ensuring compliance with the medical regime. Um, all of those kinds of, in all of those kinds of contexts, corporations are interested in getting data to, to create the tools that would allow those kinds of things to happen. Um, so I've been looking at that along with a team that includes doctors from Women's College Hospital, the University of Toronto um, and Indigenous data experts. Um, and facial recognition technology is another really important and significant AI driven uh, technology that I'm working on at the moment, um, particularly focusing on police or public sector uses of that technology. And there I'm part of a shirk focused study or shirk funded study with law professors Lisa Austin and Andrea Slane, social scientist Chris Cooper, and a local police force, uh, looking at the extent that to which police forces are using AI based facial recognition technologies now, how they would like to use them in the future, um, and how to meaningfully engage in public conversation. How do we have conversations with members of the public about a technology that they may not know about? They are unlikely to understand how it works, um, which makes it really difficult to understand how it might impact them or their communities. Um, and then, of course, also involved in legal reform. So trying to figure out in, at a time when there's a great deal of public interest, or at least political interest, in revising privacy laws, which are understood to be outdated, uh, looking at what kind of laws do we need? What are the provisions in a modern privacy law would help us achieve the benefits and mitigate the risks of technologies like AI? So that's basically what I do. So that's it, eh? <laughs> yeah, just, you... just that. I hope I hope you have a I hope you have a team that you're working with. But, uh, I mean, anyway, I know you do. I'm just just teasing. So I, I do have a question for you. Uh, maybe you could explain to 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 all of us listening a little bit more about some of the ways that companies collect our data. I think you know we're aware of some. We may not be aware of all the different ways. And maybe to, to, to discuss a little bit how how this can lead to surveillance, which is you know another part of another part of your work. Sure. Um, so this is a big question. Companies collect our data when we interact with them. So whether that's through making a purchase or browsing on a website. Um, and if you've ever read a privacy policy, and of course data shows most of us don't, but if you've ever read it, you're often deemed to consent to information collection about your visit to a website the second you land on it. Um, which, you know, frankly is a fascinating perversion of the concept of meaningful consent. Um, but data is collected when you're on those sites. Um, or it can be collected by a company when you're looking at one of their ads on another site. Um, data is also collected, of course, when we use products. And we used to say in the advocacy community, particularly, if you're not paying for a service, you're the product. 
but that's completely passe now, it's out of date, because if you're using a product that somebody has labeled smart, in particular, you're virtually guaranteed that the company has two revenue streams, a little stream um, when you buy the product, product and a bigger ongoing stream that's built on the data you generate when you use it. Um, so those are, those are the things that we, we tend to be aware of. We know about those means of data collection because they happen when we're making deliberate choices to buy things or to interact with companies or, or websites at least, which could also be run by institutions that, that we're interested in engaging with. Um, on the other side, there are the practices of what Shoshana Zuboff famously calls surveillance capitalism. Um, and she's got a, a very pointed definition of that as the unilateral claiming of private human experience as free raw material for translation into behavioral data. Surveillance capitalism involves what she, the collection of what she calls data exhaust, the traces we leave as we go about our business online. Um, and those traces are collected and used in ways that are often opaque to us as those who are doing, you know, navigating the websites. Um, arguably deliberately slow in many cases, and they're not necessarily linked to transactions we've chosen to make, but simply generated by virtue of the fact that we are engaging in a technologically mediated um, process. They're generated by virtue of, of the places we go and the kind of data collection mechanisms that those sites have chosen to put in place, which can be everything from cookies, which you've probably heard of, or beacons, temporary files, log files, various kinds of storable choices. There's all different kinds of technical mechanisms um, that enable bits and pieces of data about you and your behavior as you move around online to be collected. So that, that's how it's collected. The, the second half of the question was, how does this lead to surveillance? Um, and I would say it doesn't lead to surveillance. It all is in and of itself surveillance. David Lyon, who is sort of the surveillance studies scholar in Canada, has a wonderful definition of surveillance, which is basically any focused attention to personal details um, for the purposes of influence, management, or control. Um, so if you think about that definition, it's not that the process of data collection online leads to surveillance, it is inherently surveillance. So the real question then is not how do these processes lead to surveillance, it's what kind of impact does it have on people? Um, and the answer there realistically is at different times and in different ways, there are a range of different potential impacts that depend on a, depend on a huge variety of factors, including who the, who the body is, who has the information about you, what their goals are, what they want to do with it. Um, so you know, some impacts are gonna be relatively minor. So I probably might see an ad for a low heeled pump because a site would know my age and think, ah, she's not wearing those heels. Um, my daughter, you know, gets ads for stilettos. Uh, a company is making a decision about what, we, what our be purchasing behavior might be like based on characteristics, including our gender. We're both female um, and our age. I'm older, she's younger. Uh, some impacts could be much more consequential. So, you know, I might get turned down for life insurance and have no way of knowing why, because the insurer has bought a data set that includes details of the kinds of online medical healthcare providers I've visited. And they've made inferences about my health and the level of risk that, I, that my health holds for them as an insurer in making a decision about whether or not to provide me coverage. And then of course, there's the public sector implications, which again, I, as a civil libertari libertarian, um, I look particularly at policing contexts and the risks there include police potentially using data generated over the years and influenced by regrettably and systemically racist behaviors to um, train an algorithm that is essentially then going to make further inferences about people and communities. Uh, so the way information is collected is sort of ubiquitous and the decisions that are made about the kinds of algorithms we use that use that data and the kinds of decisions they can make about humans are profoundly consequential in terms of answering the question, what are the implications of that surveillance? 
Thanks, Brenda. And uh, it's uh, I enjoy listening to your uh, description of surveillance because I think uh, all of us on the panel today and and, and people listening, I think, uh, have have heard uh, that term debated quite a, quite a lot um, by by different actors. Uh, and so, you know, I think we heard it very clear that you know, in a lot of ways, uh, data collection can be is inherently uh, part of surveillance. Um, um, and I think later on, maybe we can get into discussing some of the ways that actors uh, try and mitigate um, some of the some of the potential for um, for outright surveillance through things like privacy enhancing technologies. And I know that you know, you have you yourself and some of your collaborators in that team. Uh, who, uh, well, these are these are these are among the things that that, that you're you're also concerned with. So thanks very much. Uh, next. Dr. Christopher Parsons. See, I had to say, I had to just say it once. Chris, uh, you're a senior research associate at Citizen Lab. Um, please tell us a little bit more about your own work. Uh, many of us have, you know, had the opportunity to read about some of your work, uh, and also uh, some of the, some of the comments you've had on on different uh, current events. Um, why don't you let us know a little bit more about some of your current research focuses and the work of Citizen Lab, Citizen Lab which, which I think is well known to many many people attending. But it's uh, for those who aren't, uh, it's it's worth uh, it's worth covering. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so I'll actually start by just talking about the lab a little bit um, to explain sort of where I'm from, and then I'll touch on some of the research projects and research areas that uh, I tend to take a leading role in. So the Citizen Lab has been around for a little over 20 years now. Um, we celebrated our 20th last year. And the lab operates at the intersection of human rights and digital technologies quite broadly. And so we undertake strategic research and legal and policy advocacy on issues and on areas where we think that we can have a maximum impact on affecting the direction of a conversation. So the lab, if you sort of look at us from the outside is, um, all over the place. <laughs> and really that's because uh, there's sort of five key research clusters that are constantly putting out work of one type or another. So our first team is principally focused on threat intelligence activities. So this is a research team that is trying to understand um, how civil society uh, groups and actors, journalists, human rights defenders and so forth, how they're targeted by uh, often mercenary spyware companies. and so. Last week, we released a report that showcased how an Israeli company, NSO Group, and another one, Kandiro, were uh, selling their malware to what we suspect might be parties associated with the Spanish government to target individuals associated with the Catalan independence movement. And so that team has just you know, been all over the place and has been really actively both trying to understand how the spyware works and also has been working with Apple and other major vendors when they discover vulnerabilities and reporting them to those vendors to lead to patches that go to all of our phones and applications and stuff like that. The second team at the lab focuses principally on monitoring the internet writ large with our international partners for censorship and then trying to explain why censorship exists. So why exactly in the middle of uh, student exams in country A, let's say, why does the internet go down? It turns out in some places the internet gets turned off so that students don't cheat on uh, their end of year exams, which is sort of a extreme reaction, but nonetheless is an interesting thing to find when you're doing this kind of work. Another one of our teams principally looked at disinformation and misinformation and where they're looking sort of depends on that research complement to the time. So we looked at the MENA region in the past, at times we've looked at Russia, um, and really what they're trying to understand is how disinformation spreads and flows but also more broadly, um, is it efficacious? Does it actually work? We hear about this term all the time. So part of their job and part of their efforts are to say, does this stuff matter? Um, is it having an effect? Fourth team uh, is principally involved in software reverse engineering. So that team usually is looking at uh, Chinese social media applications. And the intent there is to understand how and why different applications are censoring communications, both within China and to individuals who have registered Chinese accounts, but also in some cases, how that surveillance and censorship infrastructure extends outside of the jurisdictional boundaries of China itself. The fifth team, uh, which is where I spend most of my time, is principally looking at uh, policy and legal and foreign affairs issues. And so we're normally looking at how exactly do we uh, 
make transparent what companies are doing and, and what ways should governments be held to account. It's a pretty broad ambit. So this is where well, my research in particular tends to focus on how exactly do telecommunications companies handle your information? How exactly do any number of private companies such as social networking companies, online dating companies, so forth, how do they handle your information? What could they do with it? And what do they do with it? And then shifting over to the government side, trying to understand from a national security context quite often, as well as a law enforcement context, where I often share space with, uh, with Brenda and learn from her, her insights and research. Um, what is the government doing? And what are the implications both for Can Canadian civil liberties, human rights writ large, and how does it set international norms? It, that's an area where the lab often operates internationally, is trying to understand how the actions that are taking place in often ostensibly democratic countries could have effects uh, more broadly, and then further how less democratic or non-democratic countries are engaging in practices that, if adopted writ large, would be detrimental to human rights. Thanks, Chris. And I have a question for you as well. So, uh, which is the following. How, how does our data collected or loss of privacy affect civil society and democracy? Um, and you know, what, if any, are some of the relations between uh, impacts on privacy and, uh, and democracy? Yeah, so I mean, Brenda has done a phenomenal job sort of outlining all the ways that data is uh, generated by us and collected by a number of actors. So I think what we can start with is there's a huge amount of, uh, as my director, Ron Diebert says, sort of digital, uh, digital smoke that we leave behind us. It's just emitted persistently. You don't have to be touching your phone and there's piles of data coming off of it. Um, say nothing of your smart home. And so I think it begins with, there's a huge release of personal information. And in most people's heads, there's sort of this competing uh, paradigm. On the one hand, we think that we should have to get, uh, be asked and provide consent before this takes place. But the other hand, we're like, no one asked us anything meaningful, so they're just moving up all their stuff anyways. So the first challenge that we're having is there's all this data being collected. We think there's this normative expectation you should ask me first, but we've also sort of thrown up our hands and say, we know that no one's going to do that, even if it does happen to be in the law, it's just not going to happen. Or it's gonna be these useless click wrap things that we all have to say yes in order to you know, use the device that we own. So lots of uh, data is collected. Now, how does that intersect with privacy law? So I think, you know, as Brenda rightly noted, there's lots of ways that data is used to influence us directly. So that's, you know, one way that our privacy is impacted because our data is being used to manipulate us in some way. Sometimes, you know, to buy shoes, um, other times to, you know, direct the police to our home because we're at a high risk of possible offense. But I think the other way that we're affected, and this touches more to the democratic side, is there is, um, because of the paradigm we have, it's usually an, a liberal understanding of privacy. It's my privacy if I give it to someone else. If it's given or taken to someone else and then they scrub my information out and they bundle it with everybody else, it's anonymous and okay, so now what can you do with it? Because you're not talking about Chris or Brenda or Allison or Phil or anyone anymore. It's just anonymous data that you can use and it's bundled up. It's not even individual anonymous. It's like bundled by a, a region in a country or something. And here's where we get into the challenge where, you know, you see an assertion that we have de-identified information, it's aggregated information, it is safe information, and now we're going to make a policy decision based on it. Now we're going to allocate resources based on that de-identified data. Now we're going to, um, you know, it could be anything from building schools to assigning uh, police squads to having um, more or less fire uh, fighters floating around. It could be, we're going to build more houses, less houses, put a road here, put a road not there. And it's all done in ways as I've just presented it as, okay, well, maybe that's not a bad thing. Until you realize that when my information is de-identified as a you know, white male, the likelihood of it being you know, pretty unpleasantly weaponized against me is comparatively low. Whereas if I am uh, living in a community that isn't right downtown Toronto, that might be socioeconomically uh, challenge that faces ongoing discrimination, that de-identification doesn't really keep me safe and can lead to policy decisions being made about me that are very harmful and problematic. 
And one of the ways that we can look at this is actually um, to place and, and work the lab has done over the course of the pandemic where um, uh, PHAC, Public Health Agency of Canada, received de-identified aggregated information from TELUS along with other parties. And that information was subsequently used to assist the government of Canada and other departments at the provincial and municipal level to figure out how to allocate resources. Well, no one was asked if this could take place in a meaningful way. There is no meaningful opt out in any sense. Um, the government was often duplicitous in saying this was quite transparent when it wasn't. And this matters because we know that there is a variance in who has access to cell phones that means that um, certain portions of the population can be overrepresented and thus receive more resources. And other parts of the population may be underrepresented and receive fewer resources. And that resourcing disparity can actually aggravate inequities that exist in society. And so this is one of those areas where you can have parties who, you know, the government of Canada and tell us where they were not nefarious, they were here to help in this situation. They just had sort of crappy data um, and they were running as fast as they could like everyone was, everyone else the outfit of the pandemic. But it points to how you, know, you can have big data, you can have anonymized big data, you can use things for what are meant to be positive purposes. And nonetheless, because of problems in the data run uh, the risk of accelerating or making worse or reinforcing inequities in society. And so that's really how data collection and privacy intersect with civil society and democracy. If individuals have data collected, they don't have a real means of consent. It's used in ways they don't understand and often in ways that aggravate inequities that has a real risk of undermining trust in government, trust in corporations, trust in the policies that are rolled out, and by extension, raises questions in the strength of the democracy that they happen to live within. Thanks, Chris. Uh, what an excellent uh, overview that you just provided us. You know, I uh, I think of some of the the descriptors that are sometimes used for, uh, for privacy or the right to privacy as a as a guarantor of other rights, as a guarantor or precondition for for healthy democracy. So in some ways, it really is the gatekeeper to uh, that enables us to participate uh, in a democratic society uh, and, and as a guarantee of uh, some of our other protections and expectations of our relationship with the state. Uh, thanks very much. So now we'll turn uh, to to Allison, and you know we've heard we've heard about data collection. I think mainly in the in the in the private sector and in the in public institutions too. Um, and just would like to know from you how how this compares or how you might differ, differentiate some of these practices uh, from how you see data collection occurring uh, in the in the research world uh, in academic institutions uh, like Mila. And to what extent are there, are, you know, do you face some common challenges or, 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 or are there different uh, protocols for data collection, given that it is, uh, it is uh, more of a, it is an academic setting? Yeah, thank you, Phil. Great question. Um, so I think what's interesting about operating in the academic setting is that on one hand, the bar is slightly higher in the sense that you have ethical review boards that are overseeing um, any sort of uh, research project that you're undergoing, especially as it re relates to um, human participants. So whenever there's a human participant involved in even an AI project, um, there needs to be a bit of an ethical review that's conducted to make sure that the way that you're engaging with those human subjects um, adheres to the university's policy on ethics. So I'd say on the one hand that is a check that doesn't really seem to exist out there in the real world when public sector or private sector agencies are undergoing their uh, AI research project development and building their data sets and you know leveraging data on human subjects. Um, but at the same time, you know, there is, a, I want to say, a bit of a lower threshold of responsibility when it comes to um, research work that's done in this space. And that partly comes from the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, the work that's being done on the research side can always be justified as plainly research. There's no economic or at least there's no clear economic interest at stake. We're not turning a profit. Uh, the goal of the work is simply to create another layer of scientific understanding upon which future scientific developments are built. Um, 
so I would say that there's that interesting combination of both the higher threshold of the ethical review, but the lower threshold of there's very little accountability. Um, at the end of the day, you know, you do to some extent share the work that you're doing and making it open source, whether the data that you're collecting you're making open source or you're sharing the results of your research through a publication. Um, but there's very little accountability outwardly because no one's really looking at your tool as something that is systematically deployed uh, in production in the way that a company's tool might be. Um, so I, I would say that that's I guess the biggest differentiator. Um, and then I guess the only other thing I would add is in the context of academia, where we don't necessarily have a social media platform with which to collect data on people, um, the approach that is often taken is that of data scraping. You can scrape data off of <laughs> many platforms, um, not you know, I think there are certain platforms like Facebook, like Instagram, that have special um, software built within them that make it quite difficult to to scrape those websites. But there are other platforms that have publicly available data. Um, and keep in mind, just because it's publicly available doesn't mean that you're not breaching privacy rights by scraping it. Um, but that's often how some of this data ends up being collected. Um, so that's an important other consideration to keep in mind. Jury's out on whether the <laughs> academic research approach is more ethical or not, um, but I will say that at the end of the day, the motivations are quite different. If you're operating in the research context, often you're looking to publish. Um, and if you're operating in the private sector, you're looking to turn a profit off of people's data. Um, and that contributes to vastly different practices. And then finally, I would say in academia, we have had the luxury to pivot a lot of our research in light of evidence coming out around policy or legal or ethical challenges in the approach that we had been taking. Um, and I have seen in practice, or I guess in, in the private sector, there being less room um, to make changes in light of ethical or legal considerations. Um, so sort of long-winded answer, but um, that's how I would compare it to the to the research side. Some some really terrific distinctions you made or or, or contrasts uh, with the uh, higher threshold, but then uh, I think something that we don't necessarily think about very often, which is uh, yeah, given the in general the kind of public interest objectives of academic research, yeah, maybe that is an incentive to 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 collect more data than or different types of data. Um, uh, on its own, um, and uh, even though the incentives are, 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 are for the public for the for the for the public good, uh, and not for profit, as in uh, private corporations, uh, they, you face a lot of the same questions ultimately. Um, just because I know that uh, you know, Chris, obviously, this is your 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 domain, and and uh, and uh, Brenda as well, that uh, you're both researchers. Do you have anything to add to this uh, to this point? Because uh, you know these would be these would be questions that you uh, you're faced with in your own research. Otherwise, I have many other questions for you. I would just say that um, it's getting better, but um, there is an ongoing challenge um, to to point to something that Allison mentioned. Um, Academics have to go through a research board process, and I think that they can be very frustrating, but it's not a bad thing. However, um, there is a tardiness, let's say, um, amongst many research uh, ethics boards to fully comprehend and assess the possible risks for what is being done. So as an example, you know, when it comes to scraping personal information, some research ethics boards are very, very careful, like, is this a violation of the law, you know, and they're very hesitant. Um, and others are like, oh, well, if this, if it's public, it's fine. And so I just raise this to, to point to one of the other challenges within academia is that, you know, there may be cutting edge researchers who really understand what they're doing, but ethics boards haven't necessarily caught up at the same speed. And so it does mean that there's an, in, uh, an unequal sort of um, process by which researchers are evaluated. And it speaks to a need both uh, among scholars to, and researchers to come together and talk about what's appropriate, what's not. And to be clear, we don't all always agree on that. 
um, and then communicate that to university administrations who also operate in different jurisdictions with different laws and different norms. And so it's, it's a really fascinating and challenging element of the academic side of that debate that often is very different from the debates you'll get on the corporate side. So let's say you work at Facebook, you go through the, uh, the indoctrination protocols, um, and then you really do have access to a lot of data to run experiments outside of uh, a series of important conditions they do put on uh, the research staff. So it's, a, it's really novel um, in terms of the challenges to figure out the norms, apply the norms in academia, and then simultaneously look at what the private sector is doing, saying, how is it possible you could do some of that research? <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I would, I would just, so my recent experience at sort of the, the junction of research and uh, private sector is I've served as a civil society representative on a working group that is looking at developing uh, data governance provisions around a, a healthcare data set produced through research by researchers um, at a university health network. And they're thinking through, um, you know, very carefully, um, who gets to use the data that is generated um, in our practices? Who get what kind of research is allowed to happen? Um, and are there any are there ever, you know, reasonable times when, say, a project funded by a large pharmaceutical company um, would reasonably get access to that, to that data? And under what conditions would that be? And what kinds of guardrails would need to be put in place in order to allow research to be funded as it needs to be, but also to avoid undue influence uh, by funders um, when we're talking about inform information that was collected in this case from patients um, who agreed um, deliberately were asked and gave consent for the use for research purposes, um, but who were never asked or agreed to give consent to um, their data being used for commercial purposes. And of course, there are studies that show that people are often quite willing to contribute data for research where they're quite unwilling to contribute that data for uh, commercial purposes. So I think uh, within academia, there are interesting conversations happening about you know, what, is, what do we collect and what are we really allowed to do with it and where are the ethical boundaries in the research that we do, even to the, even to the level of who funds that research and might have influence over the kinds of problems we study. It's a fascinating area to think about. Thanks very much for that. I think uh, that kind of segues into our next topic or question quite well, which Brenda is again for you um, to begin at least. The you know some of the things we opened with uh, each of you really, uh, uh, you know, it gives us the sense that it's impossible for us to really know or to avoid whether uh, being tracked in the digital age or in the, in the digital digital economy is that true? Is it? Is it, it? Do we have any defenses against being, uh, you know, the, some of the data collection that you talk about, the data exhaust or data smoke uh, that Chris described, and 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 it being collected without our consent, even sold? You would think in some domains, particularly uh, sensitive domains in 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 healthcare, for instance, uh, where you would think our, we would have greater protections there. And 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 uh, uh, can you just comment? on that a little bit is that are there are there still spheres uh where we have uh where we have um better protections and and shouldn't have to uh, don't have to th worry about uh, data collection or surveillance or being tracked uh and and yeah maybe just start with that because that's already quite a quite a little quite a bit um and uh, uh, as a, you know, as I say all that, I'm reminded of uh, a section of uh, also from Shoshana Zuboff's book. There's so many quotable sections, but one of them that helps us understand this is she talks about uh, kind of the, the exchange of data from one party to the next as a as a sequence of uh, I think it's an infinite regression uh, of rights. Um, and you know, is that true? Is it you know, if one party collects our data, gives it to another? And to another, and down the supply chain of actors, uh, you know, is that 
is that is that also true in, in domains like you know healthcare and for our medical data? You don't do little questions, do you, Phil? <laughs> um, and with credit to the organizers who provided many of these really thoughtful and, and provoking um, issues for us to talk about. Um, so there are areas where theoretically we do have enhanced legal protections for our data. Um, and healthcare health information, of course, is one of them. Um, this is something I've been looking at very closely in relation to the, the health information project that I've been working on, uh, where I led a, a legal analysis in this area, because increasingly um, we have technologically mediated appointments with healthcare providers, um, where the healthcare providers continue to be publicly funded and subject to health privacy laws, which are provincial, um, that do provide you know, do recognize that personal health information is a particularly sensitive category of information and do attempt to put in place enhanced legal protections um, for that. I mean, unfortunately, one of those enhanced protections is often allowing for de-identification for particular kinds of analysis. And, and Chris has already highlighted where, uh, some ways in which that can still remain problematic. But nonetheless, there are expectations around particular uh, protections for personal health information. The problem comes um, when we've now got commercial providers who are facilitating the connection between patients and their doctors. Um, in Canada, because healthcare has been publicly funded for a long time, um, I think we, we all have a real expectation um, that it's possible to have a trust relationship with our healthcare providers. Um, I think that if you look at survey data, people have a, a high degree, you know, a relatively low degree of trust in governments to protect their information and a comparatively high degree of trust in medical professionals to protect their information. Where that has the potential to go awry in the big data world is where you've got the commercial provider giving, providing the platform for the communication between patient and doctor. And and that's a process that sits at the junction of private sector law that governs commercial interactions, and then the public sector laws that govern healthcare information. Um, so we've identified some significant gaps uh, between those laws. That's probably as much detail as you need there. But the, the sort of broader answer is we do have laws that do recognize um, the sensitivity of, of some kinds of information. At the same time, uh, there are real questions about the adequacy of those laws. And I think that's something that we'll talk about a bit more as we move forward um, to, to deal with the challenges in an information age when the law was created at a time when a file was a piece of cardboard wrapped around a stack of paper and not a data set that potentially contains millions of granular and intimate details uh, about you know, and millions of individuals. Thanks very much. I, I might just um, uh, flip the question a little bit for, for Chris and Allison, um, you know, in, in a similar vein, I just, you know, I understand that we have, you know, greater protections in some spheres and, you know, Brenda just talked about in the medical world. Um, so we have stronger protections in law. I want to hear a little bit more about some of the protections that we have, some of the technologies that can help uh, offer some protection and, and really, you know, meet the expectations of the law or, um, you know, think about privacy enhancing uh, technologies, uh, you know, wh whatever, whatever you want to call it, people say privacy protective technologies, what, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So maybe Chris and Allison, you know, could you maybe describe some of these different approaches, uh, you know, in, in some how how they how they can work, some of the limitations, and you know, and Allison, maybe you know, in some of your uh, applied projects with Mila, um, you know, I'd be really curious to hear, you know, what, what what if any of some of these you might be using on a regular basis. So whoever wants to go first, I'm happy to start. 
Um, so when I was, before I was working in applied AI projects, I was also doing some work on the ethics of AI side, doing some volunteer uh, at various organizations. And I remember that a big focus area for us was always with the privacy enhancing techniques. Um, how do we preserve people's individual privacy while still being able to benefit from these large swaths of data and train our models to be highly accurate without, again, endangering the privacy of, of those whose data was collected. Um, in practice, I've seen very little of that. I know, in fact, that there's some experimentation happening um, even with an organization called the Global Partnership on AI, where they're running a case study on some of these privacy enhancing techniques um, in the hopes of generating certain best practices and, and disseminating that more widely. Um, what I see in practice so far um, has been a lot less high tech. Uh, what I see instead are is mostly documentation around, um, I guess it's documentation around the data sets that you're using um, so that I guess if you do breach people's privacy rights, um, you can sort of detail that data collection process and almost raise a flag to the fact that that might have compromised um, the rights and, and privacy of others. Uh, so it's really been mostly around <laughs> just sort of providing that level of transparency. Um, but I mean, by no means is that a substitute for, uh, for being able to accurately protect people and their privacy in the model training process. Um, but again, I, I haven't seen much in the way of privacy enhancing techniques that work. And to some extent, that really dictates the work that's being done in the sphere of AI, at least AI for social good, um, because it's very difficult to collect certain types of data. And therefore, there's very little in the way of AI technology that's being developed in those domains. Um, so maybe I'll leave it at that and leave it to you, Chris. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, I think that you know, when we're thinking about technologies that offer superior privacy protection, I think there's some that you can sort of rattle off that are like helpful or positive, you know, how you encrypt your data more regularly when you're surfing the web or, you know, how do you block ads from tracking you as they are persistent little snoops, um, you know, some companies might offer hardware software that's more privacy protective without naming any of them. And, you know, you can go down that list. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we have right now is a lot of the efforts that people understandably have as individuals is what the heck can I do? Right? <laughs> Give me three tools that will keep me safe and I will, you know, sleep a little bit less uneasy. But I think the challenge with that is these are collective action problems. And so there's any number of things as an individual you can do, but you know, your ability to out with you know, whoever is trying to monitor your activities, um, unless you are well-resourced either in time, money, or you know, academic training, um, you will be defeated. And to give you an example, you know, Apple is trying to reduce the amount of tracking that goes on iPhones. And even as they were proposing it in betas, there were huge multi-billion dollar conglomerates that were trying to figure out how to get around every one of Apple's protections. And so we have billion dollar company funding billion dollar company, um, you know, as a non-billionaire stepping into that and how do I protect myself? It's, uh, I feel under-resourced, I'll put it that way. I do think that we are seeing some changes, however, including awareness at the corporate level. So a good example was this week. Um, it was revealed through a leak that Facebook sort of has this big data lake, which is 100% non-compliant with uh, European Union's GDPR regulations, where you have to actually tag what people have consented for and how data can be used. And apparently, Facebook is good at the collection and not good at the tagging, which puts them in violation of the law. And so they're freaking out internal to Facebook saying, hey, we might have to totally revamp the entirety of our advertising business because it is fundamentally non-compliant with law. It's gonna be a multi-year thing to try and re-architect our lives um, just not to operate in Europe. So does that mean that Facebook is going to be privacy protective? Probably not, <laughs> but um, it does showcase that, you know, governments are waking up and starting to do stuff. GDPR isn't brand new by any stretch of the imagination and it takes time for law to take effect. And so, 
we are slowly moving to a process um, legally that companies are starting to understand, oh crap, I have to do something and I can't just like wave off something with like a, a nagging cookie banner or something that will keep me safe. The other thing that I think is actually starting to take place, and I, I would love to say that this is happening everywhere, but you know, that would be worse than a pipe dream. Um, but we are starting to see an increased thoughtfulness amongst some researchers, um, especially when it comes around to developing next generation big data AI based projects. And it isn't even like, can we make this more efficient, which is often a pretty high priority if you have a bad algorithm that's spitting out bad data, it's not very useful one way or the other. But we're getting to the point where we're asking questions. We can do this. Maybe we can make it really efficient. Should we do this? Is What are the ethics behind what we're trying to do? So to give you an example of that, we're seeing increased discussion about, you know, should we have facial recognition technologies available to law enforcement? You know, is a question, not, a, not necessarily a, a completed yes, no answer at this point. It's quite often a, a caveat, it's complicated. Um, but that's, you know, a useful kind of conversation to be had. And then what is the distinction? When Facebook is using facial recognition, so that when you show up in a photo, it like auto tags you that like, you know, hey, you were at a party and someone tagged you, um, versus when the cops are going through um, a protest to figure out everyone who's at it. So there's a very different power differential that's taking place there. And so I actually think that, you know, if you if we're reaching for technologies, I sort of tend to agree with Allison that, you know, it's a scant set of technologies you can reach for and you can't really rely on them all the time. But socially, we're at a different point um, than we were five, 10 years ago. And I think that, that means that not only are we having the legal and social discussions, but also the norms and the values that are in those conversations are making their way down to research groups that are developing and implementing new technologies. And I think that you know this is not a technology thing to solve. It's a social and political and legal issue with a technological focus. And I think we're finally getting to the point where that discussion is becoming a little bit more robust, such that we can actually have real discussions and come to real conclusions in some of these uh, some of the debates. And, at least talk about throwing your problems that we're facing. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, you know, listening to each of you, I'm, I'm struck at kind of the process at which we get to, let's call them solutions to some of the privacy challenges we had, uh, privacy challenges we have, and I'm thinking again, technological solutions, uh, legal and technological solutions. But, you know, it seems like as we move further into the future, we learn more about some of the uh, events or occurrences or scandals uh, through researchers, investigative journalism, combination of the, of the two, really. Uh, then we get to we get into a phase where we're defining the problem, and I think Chris is what you're talking about. Uh, you know, some of the, the social and political questions that we need to answer about, um, you know, what data should be collected, how, uh, what types of protections should be in place once it's collected. Uh, and then, you know, new obligations are created and companies have to have to have to meet their obligations. But meanwhile, more data is being collected, more data smoke, data exhaust, uh, you know, more technology, more AI is being trained on more and more data. Um, and and the kind of just scale of technological advancement is just outpacing these discussions by leaps and bounds, uh, uh, you know, faster than the laws can change. And faster than, let's call them these, you know, nascent privacy enhancing technologies or, as solutions are being developed or invested in uh, as, uh, as, as, as themselves matters of research and technical solutions to some of the legal obligations that are being creative after we uncover, uh, you know, another scandal. So, you know, I'm struck by one of the questions that was put to us for, the, for this evening, which is, you know, in this kind of, in, in this kind of, um, uh, uh, faced with these number, th this type of dilemma where we're constantly being outpaced, uh, both on the social and political discussions that inform law, then the technological solutions uh, that are being uh, uh, advanced or, or, or developed to, to meet our legal obligations, uh, to enable companies to, to meet their le legal obligations. You know, what kind of hope do we have, uh, uh, so to speak? Like, well, how, how do we get ahead? Can we get ahead uh, of, of the next scandal or the next type of uh, collection or use that, that uh, creates issues for us? Um, and I, you know, part of, partly I'm, I'm saying this because at the 
some of you who are listening will, will see the, the banner behind me at the Schwartz Reason Institute for Technology and Society. You know, we do we have a focus as part of our, our, our institute on the role that technology can play in helping to uh, helping individuals, researchers, companies to meet their legal obligations uh, for AI, for data. And, and we really see that an underinvestment in, and, and, and less attention being placed on these technologies as potential solutions. Uh, there you know, many of them for data, for AI, for privacy, for, for AI, they're being developed. They don't really ex exist yet as mature solutions. And that's a problem. So, you know, maybe I'd like to hear maybe some more reactions if you have any about, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, technology is going to be a part of the solution. And, 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 and if so, uh, you know, what we need, what we can do to, to, to move the needle a little bit. And this is open, so I, I won't, you know, <laughs> whoever has, a, whoever has the, the quickest reaction gets to go first here. Uh, yeah, I do have a thought on this. Um, from my understanding, it seems like, you know, we like to paint a lot of these AI companies as being very uh, regulation and legislation averse. But in my experience and in speaking with people that are working for these types of organizations, they are quite interested in um, partnering with governments to some extent. And of course, there's a bit of a conflict of interest there, but, but seeing governments um, create more in the way of guiding policy and regulation in how this technology should be developed and, and what standards um, these companies should be adhering to as they develop their technology. And part of the reason for that is because, as you said, Phil, this technology is developing very quickly. And, you know, they, a lot of these companies may be in a position where because they've developed this technology so quickly without any sort of regulation or legislation informing um, the scope of that development, they might be incredibly susceptible to, um, to you know, whether it's, um, I guess it's just really just any sort of uh, legal challenge that individuals or companies or the government might have with the result of the technology that they've built. Um, and this sort of gets at part of the question that I, we had been posed um, by TSPN, which is really around, you know, how do you see the relationship between economic growth and um, the policing of these technologies? And to me, it seems like if we're going to make an industry that's viable long term, we need to have the legal infrastructure there to support it. And so that, you know, organizations developing this tech have a good understanding um, of how it should be built and, and how to protect themselves from uh, any sort of legal backlash that uh, comes down the pipe. So to me, the solution is really in a collaborative partnership. Uh, obviously, there has to be a lot of due diligence done to make sure that the conflicts of interest at stake um, are not the ones guiding the discussion on what sort of policy and legislation should be created. Um, but there's obviously a bit of a power discrepancy, or at least an information discrepancy among policymakers on what sort of technology uh, could be leveraged in the course of their enforcement of various um, legal principles in this space. So I think there's a lot of room for a collaboration. Um, because frankly, I, I see it as being in all members' interests to have a robust set of regulations in this space because it's coming whether we like it or not. So it might as well be something that uh, we know about now rather than having to retroactively, you know, dismantle a lot of our AI models later. Um, I'll start with that. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, so I mean, I take sort of the part of the thrust of your question, Phil, like how depressed should we be? <laughs> is there hope? Is there hope in the world? I always like to think of I'm one of the most hopeful cynics that's around. So um, does technology have a role to play? Of course it does. I mean, you know, technology is a social and political uh, artifact, right? You know, we, we build tools because we find them useful in our lives or to facilitate something in, in society, right? So there's, Technology has to be there, it, it can't not. 
Um, that having been said, I think that some of the, I think some of the problems, frankly, that we have with, you know, quote unquote AI and big data, I mean, there's, there's a lot of projects that uh, continue to be rebadged under wherever the new hotness of uh, the name happens to be. I think part of the challenge is there's a lot of stated efficacy that is often not subsequently evaluated, right? And so uh, let me give an example again of Facebook, right? And, and you know, Shoshana Zubrick, um, it points to Facebook as, you know, a pretty serious player in the surveillance capitalism world. And I don't disagree with that assessment, but it's important to recognize that like Shoshana's work has been good for Facebook in some ways because it like convinces people that it works, right? Like how many times have you seen an ad and you're like, oh, I need to buy that. I mean, I'm sure it happens sometimes, but it's not like a mind ray device as Cory Doctor likes to refer to it. Um, and, and you know, if you were to read what Facebook and other people have written about them, you think that it, it's this phenomenally effective tool. In some cases it is, and in other cases it's not. This isn't to sort of dismiss the critiques against Facebook or other companies. But rather it's to say that we need a more nuanced understanding of what algorithms are doing, what data sets are they drawing from. And once we have that kind of information, which will probably involve interrogating them using tools of technology, then we'll be in a situation to understand what we should do. So my hopefulness is, yeah, like we can build tools to adversarially assess how things have been developed. And as we develop those techniques, as they become increasingly common, then I think there is some hope. Now, lest I leave you on a hopeful note, um, I think that the problem with that is it expects a high degree of expertise or it demands a high level of expertise. And, you know, setting aside um, the number of people we are training or are not training in uh, AI and big data and machine learning, if you just look at cybersecurity, which increasingly is implicated, in uh, a variety of big data uh, modes of analysis. You know, we are not graduating in Canada alone, you know, hundreds of thousands of people a year that we need in cybersecurity, right? And it's compounded across all sorts of IT fields. So I just said that this adversarial learning models, like that's one way of many that we can try and figure out what's working, what isn't, so we can build good legislation. What's the pipeline for building that talent? How are we going to get people who are able to do that work. So that's a funding issue at the training level. Then who are we going to endow with money that is positioned to undertake these adversarial efforts? So there's a funding issue of employment. And then how do we retain those people um, if let's say it's government or nonprofits or academia when uh, corporations show up and say, hey, we can give you like three times the money um, and you can keep doing the same work, but for us, and as a result, um, raise some questions about independence. And so I do think that there are technology as well. I do think there's a way forward, but a lot of it's tied to how do we get the talent to move beyond sort of the stage where we're at right now, which is conceptualizing how to do that, and how do we actually implement it at scale? And, and that's one of the big challenges I think that is in front of us. So again, don't want to leave anyone with hope for that, so I'll leave it there. Thanks, Chris. Brenda, I want to give you an opportunity to, to jump in on this one as well. Yeah, I've got company. Um, so I, I think I agree with both Chris and Allison uh, that there have to be ways for technology to help us out of this problem. Um, but I think I'm pessimistic about the um, ways in which that kind of help can be monetized compared to the ways in which um, other kinds of technology can be monetized. So, and then Chris was pointing to this, what, what are the incentives for people to do the work of creating technologies to help us better manage the way that technology works when you can just make a new technology instead that will make you bucket some more money. So I think we need to find ways to incentivize um, that kind of oversight, whether it's through technical means or others. And, and for me, the way that we do that is through legal reform. Um, we have private sector privacy laws um, federally 
for most of the country uh, with a few provincial laws that have been enacted that are substantially similar to that private sector law. Um, and the private sector laws are about balancing people's interest in privacy with businesses' interest in using the data. Um, given the sort of differential in power between individuals and corporations, that framing has not served us well. Um, CCLA and many other civil society organizations argue that what we need are laws that um, explicitly recognize privacy as a human right. So that the balancing act is between the right that we all have to privacy as a, you know, which contributes to things like human autonomy and dignity and liberty and a democracy. So, you know, and as you pointed out, um, as, a, as a guarantor of other important rights that we value, particularly equality rights, when we talk about the potential for discrimination um, that's created by leveraging big data, can be created by leveraging big data. Um, so we, I would argue that we need to think as we go through the process of legal reform, which you're absolutely right, is too slow and has lagged behind technology, about how do we future-proof our laws. Um, this, I often do talks where I complain about how creaky and outdated our privacy laws are, but the reality is because they are principles-based, they have actually served us better than we have any reason to expect given how old they are. And we need to continue thinking through what are the principles that we need to protect? How are those principles challenged by the kinds of emerging technologies that we've seen? Um, and then how can we set up the right safeguards within that principle-based legal framework uh, to move us forward in ways where we, where we admit that we will never know all of the new and exciting and interesting and terrifying ways um, that someone might come up with to leverage data and to use AI or other technologies in the future. Um, but we do know uh, the values that we hold dear as people in Canada, in a, in a democratic state, as people who, you know, if you look at polls, uh, think that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms currently having its 40th anniversary is, is one of the prime achievements of, of Canadian government. So I think that um, that kind of legal reform where we truly reflect on privacy as the internationally recognized human right it is, and then develop laws that are grounded in the principles um, that support the values that we share is the way to move that forward. Is it slow? Yes. Is it creaky? Yes. Is it time consuming and frustrating and depressing? <laughs> yes. Um, but it's also an area where I think the people who are in this audience, people who are scientists, people who are technologists, people who are um, aware of um, how science works, how technology works, what it means to have evidence, what it means to need data and use data in the process of doing important work um, are exactly the kinds of people that I think it's important to, to be aware of the challenges that we face in, in regulating technology and doing so in a way that, we hear this all the time, doesn't stifle innovation, but at the same time protects people um, as we go about our daily lives that are increasingly enmeshed in digital systems um, and, and data generation. Thanks, Brenda. And, you know, I think you've, you've made my task uh, quite easy as I was looking for a way to, to shift a little bit to AI as we, we've been discussing big data uh, and privacy quite a bit and surveillance, but we do want to cover AI a little bit and talk about some of the challenges there. And in discussing the need for legal reform on, on, uh, on privacy, um, you also mentioned the resilience of the approach that countries like Canada have taken so far, uh, of, of the principles-based approach. Um, so as we, as we start to begin our discussion on AI, uh, my first question, and maybe for Allison can, 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 can start to answer it. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about responsible AI, trustworthy AI, and some of the principles that have come up uh, over the last three or four years to help us understand how AI should be governed. Um, you know, I think um, since efforts like, you know, the Asilomar principles, the OECD principles, the EU, the EU ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI, um, I think there's been close to 170 efforts to develop AI principles 
So, uh, you know, at least there's a convergence around the approach, right? Uh, there's a principles-based approach is almost certain. We've seen some countries go at it um, a little differently or begin to, if you're thinking of the European Commission and it's, it's a, a new piece of legislation. Uh, I think we could say that it's principles-based. I think we could also say that it's quite prescriptive in, in some respects. Uh, and there's pros and cons there. But before we get into some of these, uh, some of these topics, maybe let's just zoom out a little bit for, for some of us who are maybe uh, attending uh, this evening and, uh, and are, are a little less familiar with approaches to, uh, to governing or regulating AI or AI ethics. Um, and, you know, Allison, maybe could you just give us a sense of what some of the, these leading principles are? You know, there. Are, you know, we hear a lot about bias and fairness, for instance, as as some of the uh, bias is a challenge, and, and fairness is one of the uh, one of the one of the the principles that we're we're striving for. Could you just tell us a little bit, maybe, about algorithmic bias um, and and some of the ways that uh, that researchers are trying to uh, uh, eliminate bias or detect bias. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. And uh, I think that's right in sort of characterizing the current ethics of AI domain as heavily principles based. Um, there are, I want to say there's some consensus now at least around some of the main ethical principles that we should be aware of as we're designing our technology. Um, but bias is definitely one of the biggest ones, I would say, or at least gets the most airtime. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is it really gets at the fabric of the technology itself, of the data that you're using to train your models and then how the model reproduces um, this injustice of bias. Um, more often than not, it's, it's unintentional rather than intentional, although I would argue that some biases are probably for the best. Um, but in the case of algorithmic bias, I think the reason we see it is because our algorithms at the end of the day, they learn based on training data and they have a mental model, so to speak, of how the world works based on that training data. So if your training data is limited in any way in the sense that it underrepresents or overrepresents any particular demographic group, whether that's um, women, whether it's black women, whether it's black gay women, you know, they can be all uh, various intersections of people's identities. Um, your model either will not perform as well on that group, or it will look at the group that is overrepresented in the data set and assume that um, it's more likely that that group, you know, I mean, fill in the blank, whatever it is that you're trying to, um, I guess, anticipate or predict uh, as having to do with a particular demographic group. So, you know, what's constantly referred to is this, the Amazon hiring example where um, Amazon created an AI tool that would help sift through applications and refer to the hiring manager uh, interesting candidates. And because there was an overrepresentation of men in that, uh, in Amazon's previous hiring, the models sort of thought that you had to be a man to be suitable for a job at Amazon. And so it referred only the applications of men. And that sort of goes to show how the skew in the data that over represents a particular demographic group leads to bias in favor of that demographic group, at least in that particular example. Um, and then you can also think about if you are part of a demographic group that is underrepresented in the data set, then you know, again, either the data set will assume that because you're a woman, you're not suitable to work at Amazon, or it simply just isn't accurate um, when, when deployed on that demographic group. And a common example here is uh, AI models that are used to detect skin cancer. Um, when they were training these models, often the, they used Caucasian skin in the data set. And as a result, the models weren't nearly as accurate in predicting malignant or benign um, uh, skin problems when it came to any skin type other than Caucasian skin. And so, of course, this, this can actually be quite uh, detrimental given that it's uh, an AI applied to the healthcare context and has to do with the quality of care provided to, to individuals. Um, and so this is a really 
big problem and it manifests in so many different ways depending on the AI application that you're talking about. Um, again, something that is taking off in the um, in the technical space as a way to address this problem is reporting. Um, so mostly there's I, I, a lot of documentation, I think it was coming out of Google with um, Meg Mitchell around the reporting on your data sets, but also the reporting on your models so that you could be quite transparent with, you know, how your data should be used, what sort of limitations it has, how representative it is of various demographic groups. Um, because often if you make your data set available online, everyone is, is looking for data and will just simply take your data and run it through their models and, you know, claim to have a very robust model that can perform in a particular context. And so you want to make sure that people are well aware of any drawbacks and limitations that your data set might have before they try to uh, claim that your their model is going to be robust in, in any particular setting. Um, so reporting on the data sets and then reporting on the models themselves, you can look at how your model performs accuracy wise on um, on various data sets and disclose any limitations that you see. You can actually test to make sure that your model performs well on demographic groups that may be underrepresented in the data um, and then publish documentation alongside your models and and data to say that, you know, here's where our model does well and here's what it where it's not doing so well. Um, and then I know there's a, a project called the Data Nutrition Project, which is also gaining traction. Um, and it's really a matter of analyzing in a systematic way various data sets and giving it a score in terms of how quote unquote healthy it is. Um, and one of the metrics that they measure is representative representativeness of individuals within the data set such that it may or may not contribute to bias when you train your, your algorithms. Um, so it's reassuring to see that there's some transparency in this space, but again, it's not legally required that people publish any sort of disclosures um, that may predispose their data set to uh, biasing the models that they're training, which is unfortunate. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. I really like the, the example of the data nutrition uh, project. Uh, if, if folks who are listening don't know about, uh, about this group, they should look, look them up. This is kind of a great example of an effort um, that, that uh, uh, kind of ties, ties together some of the topics we've discussed so far. It's a, a kind of a platform for, uh, for in, in, in ensuring a certain level of data quality and, and uh, bias prevention uh, across the design of AI systems. Uh, it's a software-based platform, and it's the kind of um, uh, technical solution that really researchers and organizations and companies uh, will need to start doing this at scale, uh, you know, uh, more efficiently uh, and more practically. Um, and uh, I'll just add that uh, if you look down the kind of uh, to the the journey towards, let's say, you know, enforceable rules. Uh, solutions like the, uh, the, the, the data nutrition project are building uh, to the extent that they are incorporated into certification frameworks uh, that uh, are required uh, under future laws, uh, then we can start to get uh, at a level of accountability and, and regulatory oversight monitoring uh, that makes some of these uh, almost, you know, almost grassroots tools uh, parts, parts of the future legal framework. So look at that, I just kind of, jumped in onto the panel. Um, so moving right along, um, you know, Allison, I want to actually come back to you because we've, we have uh, looked at, you know, some of the darker sides of big data. And, uh, and uh, but I want to give you a chance to tell us a little bit more about some of the, uh, the projects that you're working on at Mila uh, in the AI for Humanity uh, stream at Mila. And, and, you know, you're really working on some exciting uses of AI that are truly positive, uh, you know, not without risks, but have the potential to have just great impacts uh, on our, for our society, for humanitarian purposes. And, you know, as we're talking about justice tonight, I think, I think some of, some of the, 
uh, projects you guys are leading really fit in, into that category. Uh, don't worry, Chris, Brenda, uh, I have a, have, have a great follow-up for both of you afterwards. But uh, first, Allison, why don't you just, I would love to hear more about what Mila's up to these days uh, in AI for Humanity. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so Mila is actually doing so much in the space of AI for social good. So the projects that I'm going to represent that are falling under my portfolio are just a fraction. Um, there are other projects that are, you know, AI for health related in, in the sense that we're doing lots in the space of AI uh, for drug discovery. Um, and then there's also lots happening at the intersection of AI and climate. Um, but I think some of the projects that fall under my portfolio and would be of interest to people attending this panel are um, I have one project which is actually designed to um, detect victims of human trafficking using the online escort market. And uh, again, this is a sort of highly controversial project um, and one that we're proceeding with with a lot of caution. We have um, consulted with lawyers. We've actually hired lawyers to help us determine a reasonable expectation of privacy on the escort platform. Um, we're also working with federal prosecutors to better understand what sort of evidence is admissible in a court of law when you are collecting evidence partially through an AI algorithm. Um, but what this tool essentially is, is, you know, you have a whole online escort market. You have people on there that are advertising all sorts of things, um, many of them legal and perfectly fine. But you also have many victims of human trafficking who are um, who are advertised on those platforms as well. And they are sometimes disguised as sex workers or escorts, um, but there are certain, you know, features that make it so that we can sort of detect what sort of activity is suspicious of containing human trafficking. Um, and so we're sort of developing this tool and figuring out what it would mean to play a meaningful role in victim detection or even uh, stats gathering on how this market is proliferating and, and geographically speaking, um, where some of the hotspots are. Um, so that's pretty exciting. The other project that we've recently integrated into our pipeline is um, an AI model that can help with um, enforcement efforts among policymakers. So specifically, there are many countries in the, around the world, Canada is soon to be one of them, that mandates that companies of a certain size disclose how they have rooted uh, slavery out of their supply chains. So these are massive disclosure documents that companies are obligated to present, and governments simply don't often have enough bandwidth to go through these documents and make sure that companies are in fact upholding a high standard of, you know, practices that ensure that in fact there is no slavery in their supply chains. And so what we're developing is an AI tool that can automatically sift through those documents um, and make an assessment of how legitimate uh, that process that the company undertook really was. Uh, and the vision for that is really we're hoping to increase accountability for uh, supply chain management and oversight. And I also think it's a really great example of how tech can be used to support policymakers in being more effective in enforcing and overseeing the, um, the impacts of their policy and practice. And also, you know, really making it so that their policies are effective in practice as well. Um, and then finally, we have a bias detection tool that we hope will work similar to a Grammarly, but instead of flagging your speech and suggesting ways to um, communicate more effectively, what we're flagging is uh, misogynistic content. And the hope is that, you know, because some of our misogyny is relatively, um, I guess, it's not exactly explicit, but it can be in some ways implicit, people would benefit from a tool that can help educate them on how their biases or um, biases specifically against women may be manifesting in the language that they use and helping support them in, in change that and changing their language. 
Um, so those are a couple examples of some of the projects that are falling under my portfolio. Um, and happy to talk about them further. Thanks very much. Um, I have I have a couple questions myself, but we're all, we're we're uh, we're coming up to to a point where we'd like to engage the audience, and I do I would like to ask Chris and Brenda uh, maybe just one the same question, which I'd like them both to answer uh, as we move towards the uh, more interactive portion of, of this evening. Uh, and we don't have a lot we don't have a lot of time left, uh, but we are now on the topic of AI. So you know, Chris, Brenda, for you. Uh, given some of the risks that are associated with AI, we've talked about bias. There are others. Uh, there, we've touched on, you know, earlier on, we, we mentioned things like facial recognition technologies and, 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 and law enforcement. Can you just tell us what you think are the, are the, is the, the single most, um, uh, you know, gravest risk that we face as AI is being used uh, and is under either un or underregulated uh, as of yet. Uh, what are some of the some of the most pressing challenges that we face, um, you know, in, in this AI age? Um, go first. So I think there are two. One of which is un, one of which is appreciated by a number of researchers, but it's very difficult to deal with. And the other uh, pertains to a broader social discussion. Let me touch on the first. Um, we know that society is inequitable. Like we know this is the case. Um, there is huge power differentiations. When we look at policing as an example, you know, do we want, is the problem with facial recognition that it's inefficient? And if we have a more efficient facial recognition system, it's okay. Or will that just lead to more efficient over policing of already marginalized communities, right? So I think we start with what are the power rebalancing that we want to do? Because there's a real risk that if we, aren't very critical in the way that society is currently structured, that we can move to an environment where algorithms are seen as coming to quote unquote technologically neutral decisions, of which I don't think they actually are, um, but they will be seen that way. And it will serve to reinforce inequities that have historically existed and frankly need to be corrected. So researchers understand that. They are pursuing that as best they can, but it's a major challenge because we don't even know it as a society that is more equitable inherently looks like across all facets of life. So this is a social and political issue, meaning technology issue. Um, and on that point, I think one of the real challenges is, you know, when I go into classrooms or I speak with policy experts, or I go and spend time with politicians, you know, one of the first things they usually say is, you know, they throw up their hands, they take two careful steps backward to say, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what I actually can do about this. And I move towards them and say, don't worry, I'm not one either. We can fumble through it together. And that isn't to say that because I'm not an engineer that I don't have any role, I hope that I do, but rather that I think that it is very possible for most complicated technological issues to come down to a one-on-one, here's how different components work, so some information is clearly needed. But then we're often talking about values, power, ethics, and those are discussions that really the public can and must be involved in. And there has been a, a pernicious problem in technology communities, really for the past, you know, huge number of decades, that you know, if you're not a nerd, you don't get to talk about what the nerds are doing because the nerds are busy nerding. You just enjoy the nerd goods, um, and that's not enough, right? These are we're no longer touching a small slice of society if we ever were. This affects all people in one way or another and usually invisibly. And so we need to bring people into those conversations and it's increasingly important if we are to achieve that rebalancing point that I made up front. Um, if it is constrained to academics and technologists um, and politicians uh, discussing amongst themselves, I mean, it's better than nothing, but it's not enough. We need to be bringing in the people who are actually affected by this and listen to them. If they might say something like, actually, I don't care about your AI, whatever. I just need more money in my community. So we have a community center. Don't, don't bother with smart, bother with boring and old. And we need to then hear those people and, and take it seriously and say, okay, you're saying we need to assign social resources differently. We will do it. As opposed to saying, oh, that's a, no, no, you don't understand. This is going to be great for you having like an AI gym in your living room is, is really better than a community center or something, right? We, we need to take them seriously. 
And, and that's hard to do because it often means that we'll, when we come into environments, we need to be humble, we need to be respectful, and we need to be listening as opposed to saying, here's how it works, here's why you want to use it, and here's how your life is going to improve. We often need to reverse that course. I mean, I think in a similar vein, for me, the biggest risk is that we get so dazzled by the sparkly promises of evolving technology to solve the world's problems um, that we fail to ask, are the promises that are being made ones that we want kept? Are the promises going to achieve goals that we want for our society? If the promise in a social welfare system is greater efficiency, is that goal going to support or undermine the promotion of human dignity for those who are forced to require on social assistance? Um, if the promise is more accurate social sorting, um, is that um, in any given context, is that going to help? people to be accurately sorted into categories to entitle them to important benefits? Or is it going to be harm them to be sorted out of categories that would entitle them to important benefits? So I think um, for me, the, the major questions do come down to a recognition of social inequality, a recognition that um, goals of particular systems by particular people may or may not serve um, social interests. Um, and those determinations are going to be fraught. They're going to be complicated. They're going to be contested. Um, because it's entirely possible to say, of course, it is in the public good to have an incredibly efficient social welfare system because that frees up money to give to people. Um, so I think that we need to, to be cautious um, about the promise at the same time as we're open to it um, and remain um, optimistically skeptical, is that your phrase, or optimistically cynical, Chris, about um, the ways in which we can truly leverage technology to work for us rather than having us um, working as a cog in, in the way that it functions. Well, thanks very much to the three of you. We're not done. Uh, we're going to, we're going to be asking some more questions, just not, not the ones that I've been putting to you. Um, but on the on the last point, Brenda, you know, I really like that, or I forget if it was Chris who said initially, the skeptic, the skeptical optimism. I was having some uh, discussion with some colleagues recently who are trying to who are coming at it from the other way. It just makes me it makes me smile, saying, you know, conditional optimism, or you know, something like you know. Anyway, it's a uh, skeptic. Anyway, uh, it's uh, we. Ha I think it is helpful to look at to try and. Uh, um, you know, define the type of approach that we have when we're looking into the future about technology and we want it to play a positive role. So we want to be optimistic, uh, but we, we can't be naive about it. Um, and we have to be uh, aware of, of how it is playing a role in transforming society, uh, not just the downstream impacts that we react to, uh, but the ways that it is shaping the discussion and questions and and issues that policy and approaches that policymakers are taking to, to, to different social problems that we have. Okay, so with that, um, I will I will open the floor to some questions uh, from the audience. And I think the way that we're proceeding is uh, is orally, uh, and that's kind of a question I have for the for the organizers. Is it uh, are we the way we're proceeding? Is it people just kind of put their hand up and and uh, and and ask questions directly to the panel, or are we or are we going with uh, the chat? Oh, both. If people are not comfortable to come on the camera, we can, and we can do both. Yeah, uh, we can do both. Yeah, we're very we're flexible. So a you know come come on screen or not, uh, and um, if you like, put your question in the chat or we raise your hand. Uh, I am conversant in all the ways that you can ask questions on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any questions yet, but uh, probably I have one. Oh, okay, oh. Uh, there's somebody else. Yeah, so we can start with them. Okay, so I see uh, Ushnish Sengupta has, his, has uh, yeah, his hand up. Go ahead. 
Thanks. Um, so since there are three people here from universities, so Canadian universities have received a substantial level of funding for AI projects. And my question goes back to how do we make the universities accountable for not only economic impacts, which is what the government really wants, but also the social and environmental impacts. So if you develop a biased algorithm and that gets commercialized or you're using gig work labor to do your labeling or using all kinds of computing power and that has an environmental impact, how do we make the universities that have received a huge level of funding to accountable on their social and environmental impacts? Yeah. Good questions. I think we touched on some of that a little bit in terms of, in a broad sense, the accountability uh, the, uh, mechanisms in place for, for Canadian researchers. So, you know, just open it up to the panelists. Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. I think this is an awesome question. Um, and I think it actually speaks to what we're seeing more broadly around this concern that any sort of overstep will overstep, I mean, in terms of like reporting and accountability and transparency or any sort of legal or regulatory development might might prevent research and might prevent progress in the space of AI. Um, so I feel like to some extent we may be dealing with that as well with universities where there's some concern around, you know, if we make the bar too high around, you know, how what type of research we want to support and um, how it should be accountable from an, whether it's a climate perspective or an economic perspective or a social perspective down the line, um, you know, will we be artificially stunting some of the research that we want to be uh, promoting in this space. And I, I think that when you're dealing with academics, especially, there's a lot of uh, sensitivity around, you know, the academic freedom <laughs> to not have to do all of that reporting or, or to not have to have such a narrow um, view of, of what type of work they're allowed to do. Um, but to me, it all comes back to changing the ethos and changing the narrative around regulation and oversight and making it less um, less of a sort of fighting with one hand behind your back or I don't know the right expression but you know right now we really see it as a bit of a limitation as opposed to something that can stimulate quality research um, so to me it's something that requires a bit of an ethos change it's a little bit even more broad than the university itself uh, it's something we're also seeing among governments I think governments are so reluctant to create policy and legislation in the space because what will that mean for our economic development? Um, <laughs> so uh, I think we're dealing with a maybe a broader issue, but it's a really good point. And hopefully we will start to see some change on that front. Thanks, Allison. Uh, Chris, Brenda, feel free to jump in at the same time and just encourage anyone who wishes to, you know, put your question in the in, in the question box or, or put your hand up and we'll come to you. Chris. Yeah, so uh, first, thanks for the question. That's an excellent question. And I think it strikes to the heart of um, not just universities, but what comes out of our universities, right? And so the way that I look at something like this, it is very slowly changing. So I don't want to say that, you know, I've been around universities for way too long. So <laughs> there has been progress. But, you know, walk back. I mean, you can still get a lot of university engineering programs in this country today. And, you know, ethics and privacy might be a bolt on class. Um, at the lab, we pretty routinely get asked to come in and, like, there's a, a required, I forget what U of T engineering calls it. It's basically like a social and ethics class for engineers. And, you know, they bring a bunch of speakers in and they check the box that we've done the, the social ethics and privacy stuff. And now they can go and continue doing engineering things. And that's a problem, right? Like those issues need to be sensitized and brought through the engineering and computer science programs writ large. Um, in the same way that I would actually argue that like technical sophistication needs to be drawn into the humanities as well. So it's, it's not a one way street, but I think to begin, 
how do we make it more ethical or reduce bias? That's where we start by really taking it seriously that a university isn't just about teaching you engineering skills, but it's to provide you with a rounded education that will empower you when you go into you know, either university research labs or into the corporate world. Um, and attached to that, I think interdisciplinarity is, is really critical, right? So when we're talking about teams, you should have, as Allison has mentioned, not just engineers, but philosophers, ethicists, sociologists to try and address that. And also universities are experimental. So there's gonna be mistakes. And so I think part of the goal actually needs to be on clamping down on them. So to avoid, you know, those bad training data sets from getting out into the world is, you know, a well-intended product, but one that actually turns out to have some real ethical problems. So we need to have a way of controlling um, our excitement to share and making sure we're sharing appropriately. Now, what you when it touches on the environmental impacts, this is actually an area where I'm hopeful a little bit. Um, you know, I remember 20 years ago at the University of Guelph, there was a huge push on campus to make uh, buildings a lot greener. And um, students there did a lot of work. And the result ultimately was the gradual, not perfect landing stretch, but the gradual greening of Guelph. Um, the building I work at at University of Toronto is a little chilly all the time because it's a gold lead building, but it's a gold lead building, right? And I point to that just to indicate that I think this is actually an area where I'm very hopeful for students will continue to push universities to be more efficient in what they're doing and the kinds of resources they're, they're using. Um, both physical resources, such as energy or something like that, but also in the way that, um, you know, you pointed to, you know, gig work and labeling. Like, I remain hopeful that, you know, students hear about something problematic and they raise holy hell and it forces changes in universities over time. And so I actually am most hopeful in universities purely on the basis that we have so many people coming through our schools that are very, very smart, very impassioned, and frankly, quite often very idealistic. And those are exactly the people that are going to help universities to adopt stronger ethical protocols, stronger environmental protocols, and think more carefully about the research, especially as we're able to maintain the uh, diversity that is within our university systems in Canada. Yes, just very briefly, I mean, so I am actually not from a university. I'm with a, a small civil society nonprofit, although I spent so much of my life at universities prior to joining CCLA. Um, and so from, from that used to be an insider, now an outsider perspective, I think one way that we can help hold universities accountable um, is to um, open the door to the ivory tower a little bit. Um, and and bring in groups like mine, bring in industry associations, bring in um, professionals of various stripes into the academic environment, not, a, not for a tick the box talk once a year, um, but as research collaborators, as partners, as people who bring different kinds of perspectives uh, to the really important research work that happens. And you know, there's a process to figure out how those collaborations work and what people's roles are and what the rules of that can be. Um, but having participated in some projects like that, um, it's also an incredibly valuable process where the strengths of, of academic rigor can come together with the um, sort of different kinds of motivations, including advocacy motivations of groups like mine in terms of raising awareness about important issues, both inside and outside the academy. So I think that there's a, an opportunity for universities and possibly a, an imperative for universities to, to open the door just a little bit uh, to forms of accountability that come from outside participation in research processes. Thanks, Brenda. And I, so I see we have a hand up from Megan uh, and that we have one question uh, in the chat, which is which should be an easy one for everybody to answer. It's about Twitter and Elon Musk. Uh, but we'll we'll start with uh, with with Megan's question. So Megan, why don't you go ahead? If uh, if you still have a question. Um, we can, uh, I, I think I saw your, you go unmuted. So I'm not sure if that was, uh, I should interpret that. 
put too much weight on that. What we can go to the question in the chat, which I was actually going to ask everybody to answer in one word. Um, and I'll just read the question for everybody. Just curious, what are your opinions on Elon Musk acquiring Twitter? Any suggestions on how people with social science backgrounds can participate in technical, dis technical discussions? So we have a bit more time. Um, so you can use a few words uh, or to express your opinions on Elon Musk acquiring Twitter. Um, but you know, you may be more interested, even more interested to, uh, in the second part of the question. Um, so wh who would like to go first? Chris, how about you? <laughs> Uh, I guess if I have one word for how to respond to Elon's most recent antics, it would probably be sigh. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I think that we'll see how that moves. It's been moving very quickly. Um, it is yet to be clear how that will work out in practice. So um, it's worrying, I'll just put it this way, it's worrying that he's targeting and attacking the trust and safety lead at Twitter. Um, after they spent a bunch of time trying to make it a safer platform. And for those of you on Twitter, it's still not terribly safe. Um, but there's been a lot of effort for the past five or six years and a lot of policies put in place. And it is not clear that he will be particularly supportive of the progress that has been legitimately made uh, on that network. Um, more broadly, you know, how can people engage and participate in technical discussions? I think it really depends on the technical discussion you want to have, to be honest. Um, there's everything from, you know, you can go and you can be involved at ICANN, uh, which is the group that sort of manages um, the top level domain, so .com, .org, stuff like that, .ca. Um, and so if you're interested in like identity politics as it pertains to domains, you know, you don't have to be super technical and they're very political discussions, let me assure you. <laughs> they're also sort of long, but it, you know, if you're super interested and super keen, you can get, you get to be flown around on someone's dime is still not totally clear who it is. You could also participate in the IETF, which is another technical forum um, that, that often is interested in sort of the ethical concerns associated with development protocols. Um, but I often think that when we're talking about technical issues, they're not really hard technical issues. It's, you know, you notice how facial recognition operates in your, you know, wherever you happen to be living and the impacts that it has. And you just write about it, right? Um, I'm a pretty poor, or, you know, you do TikTok or you know, choose your medium of expression of interest. Um, and that actually has a pretty profound impact over time. There are not um, a huge number of people in the world, there's a lot of us, but there's not a huge number that are actively engaging and excited about technology, right? I don't think anyone in this webinar is like, you know, burn all the technology down. We all really like it. And so we're passionate about it because how do we make it better? And so I think bringing a socio-technical socio -technical approach to how technology operates or functions or the underlying philosophies of technology, let's say as a philosopher, um, those are meaningful because you, know, you can be a technologist and look at something or, or an engineer and look at something, oh, well, they don't quite understand you know, how something works, but there's still a good underlying point that I need to think about. And that's how research collaborations take place. So, you can always be involved in the crunchy stuff. You can always learn to code or something like that. But I actually think the real value of people who have, you know, an example of humanities education is to come forward and bring those insights. Bell Labs was not filled exclusively with engineers, let me assure you. I know people who work there. And many of them who are there were philosophers, were business majors, were poets, and they contributed equally. It isn't that they showed up from lunch. They were there and they had massive impacts on the very framework for communications infrastructure today. And as they learn more about the technology, the engineers learn more about what they did. And that's why we actually have the technologies we do, not because engineers have sort of operated in engineer land, totally disassociated from society. That's how we participate. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Allison or Brenda, we're we're all at the kind of in the last few minutes of our of our time this evening. If you have any maybe closing thoughts, I'm gonna go for the last question from Megan for my closing thoughts. Is there any hope for serious changes in privacy policies? Yes, <laughs> believe it or not, yes. 
because those ethical discussions that are held in tiny groups are multitudinous at this point. Um, the smart tech people who go where they are paid still have the opportunity to bring their values and their influence into the technical groups that they join. Um, the, it's true that politicians aren't necessarily very sav tech savvy, um, but you can have a huge impact by getting the ear of the right politician at the right time, uh, sitting on the committee that's making amendments to a law. Um, so I think that it's important not to give in to despair or to apathy when faced with the enormity of the problem, um, but to focus on small, concrete, uh, and realistic things that we can do to raise public awareness um, in the particularly in decision makers in the moments when they're about to make decisions. Uh, that's that's the work that I'm really quite passionate about. And there is a real role for a far broader group of people to engage in that kind of advocacy in a on a in a regular and um, you know impassioned way based on their own interests. And I guess just to close us off on a, a somewhat enthusiastic note, I would say that it's easy to forget how new this domain is from a mass deployment standpoint. I mean, yes, algorithms have been um, in the works for a very long time. I mean, you could argue from <laughs> algorithms as we know them today are quite different, or at least they might not actually be so different from the algorithms that we know just in the domain of math. Um, which have existed for a very long time. That being said, the AI problems that we're seeing today are relatively new. Um, and already we've seen policymakers hyper aware of some of the risks that they present. Uh, and we're also seeing the social sciences start to become more and more interested and involved in discussions that are proliferating in this space as well. Um, and I think we're only going to continue to see more of that as time goes on. So um, I don't think there's necessarily reason just yet to despair. I think we're sort of in the stage now where we're working through all of the kinks of a completely new domain developing at an incredible speed that that law up until now hasn't been able to keep up with. Um, but my sense is this is an area that is top of mind for lots of policy officials and lawyers. Um, and it's something that's going to, I guess, start to be better regulated with time. Um, and something that will continue integrating the knowledge and expertise of those outside of purely computer science uh, so that, again, the technology that we're developing is more ethical because you have more people sitting at the table who are um, privy to those types of concerns and will integrate that into the design process. So um, maybe we can end there. <laughs> Somewhat optimistic, cautiously optimistic note. I like it, and I'll take it. Um, thanks very much to, to the three of you for all, all of your questions this evening. Uh, it's really been an enriching discussion. I made I made a I made a joke before everybody joined that you know I wondered if we'd have enough uh, energy to get us to 8 p.m. But uh, you know we've easily surpassed that. It's been a, such an interesting um, and enlightening conversation. Uh, thanks for inviting me, um, and uh, it was a pleasure pleasure to discuss with the three of you. And uh, to, to, for and thanks for everybody who who stayed on this long to to hear about some of these very important topics. Uh, at this time, I'll just turn over the uh, the microphone to our organizers um, and Bipin in particular. Thank you so much uh, for everything you did to organize this. Uh, it's, it's a great event, and uh, you really did such a great job. But I'll I'll hand it over to you to for the closing the closing words this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, all the panelists, and uh, for the wonderful discussion. It has been very fruitful, uh, and long topics on legal basis and how AI works. A lot of us are in uh, understand, read about this in news, but are a lot of times confused what that implies and how that affects us to a lot of extent. And look, we had a wonderful conversations and a lot of uh, wonderful discussions on this. And I also would like to thank all the audience members for staying along and a long evening for a two hour panel uh, on this one. 
thank you everyone and i also would like to thank the university of toronto student initiative fund for supporting this panel uh, thanks uh, thank you have a good evening <laughs>